Today, I'm going to talk to you about how we can succeed even in the toughest, most difficult exams. I'm going to share with you some specific ideas which you can actually implement in your life. My name is Rajan Singh and I'm the founder of Habit Strong. And today, the idea that I'm going to share, these are not theoretical ideas that you'll find in books. This is my own experience, my own learning from all the exams that I've written in my life, all right? So whatever I've learned from preparing for civil services, writing IITJ, maybe preparing for GMAT. GMAT may not be perceived as a tough exam, but if you want to score really high, it can be a little bit challenging. And, and of course, a lot of exams, other exams that I write from day to day. So from all of that, I'm going to share with you four things which I believe are critical to help you succeed. And one more thing, there are, there are a lot of things which are very exam specific. So today I'm not going to talk about that. UPSC exam or some other specific exam, how to prepare for that, that's not the objective. Objective is high level ideas which will apply across the board for any exam. One more thing. There are some things which are pretty obvious. You have to work hard. Of course, you know that. You should practice a lot, you know that. So I'll not talk about those things, all right? Let's get started. Point number one that I want to share with you is the, what is the, think about this question. What's the single biggest mistake people make when preparing for any tough exam? In my experience, probably the biggest mistake, or at least one of the, one of the biggest mistakes is, we fall for this fallacy that the more time you have spent, the better prepared you are, which means we fall for this, how many hours do I need to study? I need to study 10 hours a day or 12 hours a day, or I'm studying 10 hours, that guy is doing 14 hours, 16 hours, and, and for I, I have prepared 500 hours, somebody has done 2000 hours, I'll be very candid with you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter all that much. What truly matters is not the number of hours. In fact, it can be outright dangerous because it will shift your focus from something that truly matters to a metric which is just it's in our mind. The world doesn't know, doesn't care how many hours you have studied. What really matters is when you're studying or learning, what is the depth and quality of your focus? If you are, if you're learning something and your phone is next to you and every five, 10 minutes, you're checking a phone, sending a message, checking some Instagram update or your WhatsApp status. If that's what you're doing every few minutes, then every time you do that, you are destroying your focus. When we, when we start reading or learning something, it takes some time to get that depth, to start building that focus bubble. And every time we check our phone or for that matter, switch to any other task, you leave your learning and switch to maybe checking your email or talking to somebody, making a call, anything else. When you do that, that bubble is burst. Again, it takes time to get in the, in the focus state. And if we keep repeating it, we, re we, we almost don't get into focus state, the focus state at all. And learning without focus, it's not effective and it is not fun. I, I love reading. I love doing things when I'm in deep focus. It's very, very enjoyable. And one more thing, when you are, when you are at, when you are onto a task, you are, you're learning something or maybe even working on something, you have to let go of everything else. If you're trying to do multitasking or switch between tasks, you are, you are hugely, you're hugely shortchanging yourself. You're just sabotaging your own performance. I have, I have experienced that when I'm able to let go of other, other things and just I'm on one task or, or learning one single thing, Sometimes I'm able to get into this very deep focus, almost a flow-like state or flow state itself. When you lose track of time, you lose track of everything else. In learning, it happens especially when you are doing some kind of active learning, problem solving or figuring things out, all right? So the, the first big idea is that if you are learning, it has to be, it has to be focused state. If you're checking your phone every five, 10 minutes, you know what I'll tell you? Don't learn, seriously, why bother? Because what you are doing, it's only for your satisfaction. It's not really going to make any difference. So when you are sitting down to learn or read something, your phone does not deserve a place next to you. Put it away, do whatever it takes, but you have to let go of distractions. One thing and only one thing for a certain duration of time. And when you take a break, take a full break, no problem. Take as long a break as you want. But Focus has to be always binary, zero or one, either 100% focus or take a complete break. This is the first major idea. Second one, I want to, 
I want to share with share that, but I, I'm gonna, I want to start by asking a question to you, which is, let's say you you did a you learned something for ten hours. You did a ten hour session, maybe a couple of sessions, adding up to ten hours, and your knowledge before the session, before these ten hours, and after the ten hours was exactly the same, or almost exactly the same. So in that case, was there any point spending those ten hours learning? My answer is, of course not. The idea of learning is you have to get better, which means, which means this, this part you'll agree with, of course, but how do you get better? You get better by finding gaps in your learning and then fixing those gaps, finding mistakes you're making and then fixing those mistakes, which means when you're practicing, let's say you're doing a practice question and you made a mistake, you should be thrilled. Wow. Because now you have found a gap in your learning and you can fill that gap. Now, this may sound pretty obvious, but sometimes we don't really do that. I'll give you a real example here. A very good friend of mine, he, um, he scored very high on GMAT. GMAT is the exam that you have to take if you want to apply for uh, MBA schools, business schools, especially in the US. And he scored 800 out of 800, which is the highest possible score. And I asked him, hey, how, how did he manage to get such a high score? And he gave a very, very interesting answer. He said, so in GMAT, you have multiple choice questions, okay? So for every question, there are four answer options. One is the right answer option, three are wrong. And what he said is this, most people, when they practice or they look at a question, they look at the question, they try to figure out what the right answer is when they're practicing. And then if they get it wrong, they'll just, they'll look at the answer options. Oh, wow, this is the, this is the right answer option. And in their mind, they try to, they try to understand why is the right answer option the right one? But he said, I did something else. I would look at the remaining three options and then ask myself, why is each one of them the wrong answer? When you are able to understand that, when you're able to find what is the, what is the wrong answer option in this case, or in general, where is the mistake? What is the mistake I'm making? And you fix that mistake. That, that is when real learning happens. So if you are whether you're doing multiple choice questions or whatever the context is, your goal is to find what are your gaps, where are you making those mistakes, and then, and only then, is real learning happening. Otherwise, what are we doing? We are just satisfying ourselves and we are fooling ourselves, we are creating this false sense of comfort that yes, I have put in effort, it doesn't matter, the world doesn't know, the world doesn't care. Remember, all that matters is your knowledge and your, your skill. All right. Let's talk about point number three. Sometimes when we are learning or preparing for these exams, we get in this very comfortable passive mode. We are sitting on a nice comfortable chair. We don't want to move too much as the book is open and we are just reading it like, a, like it's a novel or listening to maybe some, uh, maybe a, a video and we are watching it as if it's some Kishore Kumar song or a movie. And we hope that by just passive reading or passively listening, we will get better and if we feel like there is some gap, what do we do? We have this thing called revision. I will revise one more time, right? Now I'm not saying revision is not important, it is very critical, but that's not the point. The point here is if you are doing passive learning, that's a big mistake. So the third big idea I want to share is anytime, anytime you are learning or reading something, you have to do it actively. In fact, I would say most of the time, you should have a pen in your hand and you should be writing something. Now, two specific ideas here, all right? So number one is when you are reading or, or watching a video, or whatever, every few minutes in your mind, try to synthesize what you've just learned and scribble down a few sentences. It need not be very, it need not, need not be great handwriting. You don't, you're not taking notes for future revision. This is just so you are, you're, you're forcing your brain to synthesize and reproduce what you have just learned. This, this is what I like to call active note taking. In fact, on this channel, on our channel, you'll find another video in which I've talked about a couple of learning techniques. You can refer to that. And this is one of the techniques that I've mentioned there, all right? So anytime you're learning, keep taking notes and that this note taking is not for reference, not for revision. In fact, when I was preparing for civil services specifically, I remember I would just keep scribbling and, and the writing was so bad that I would never, I would in fact just write and throw it away. So these notes were for me to understand things better. It was forcing my brain to understand and reproduce what I just learned, at least the key points, and it was not meant for 
revision of future reference. One more thing. Another way to make active learning happen is solving a lot of questions. So when you, once again, when you read a question, what does it do? It challenges you. When it challenges you, now your brain is very active. You're trying to figure things out. And when you figure things out, that is when things, things sort of fall in place. Another thing that, will, that really works is practice problems. Right? So all these things, when you are doing active learning, whether it's note taking or solving problems or doing some practice or uh, maybe working on some numerical problem, all those things together, they make learning active. And that is when real learning happen, happens, which means you should never, ever be doing passive learning. In fact, if you are feeling so lethargic that you don't feel like taking up the pen, here's what I'll suggest. Stop that learning session. Get up and go for a walk, go for a run, do 10 push-ups. Whatever you have to do, do it, energize yourself and do active learning. All right, this was point number three. And the fourth and final point, which is whatever you have learned, whether you have spent two months or six months or 12 months, or whether you worked hard, easy, it doesn't matter. On the day of the exam, all that is past. What matters on the day of the exam is the performance on that particular day. And for that, what you require is this confidence. Confidence that I am going to do my absolute best. And sometimes, sometimes what happens is students or even grown-ups, they feel that I'm not prepared. What if this question comes? What if I don't know this thing? What will I write? And, and the paper has not even, or maybe the question has not even come to us. And we, in that panic, we lose the ability to stay calm and stay composed. So two ideas I want to share with you specifically. Number one, is no matter, no matter how much you have prepared, you may have prepared for two months, for one year, two years, five years, it doesn't matter. For most exams, the, the likelihood is that regardless of how much you prepare, you will always feel that I'm not ready. But you have to tell yourself, when the date of the exam comes or date of the whatever exam or uh, whatever the context in which you are going to uh, Take, the, take that opportunity to challenge yourself. So on the day on which the exam, exam is to be written, on that date, everything that is behind you, let it go. Tell yourself, I am ready. Whether you have done two chapters or all the chapters or 50% or chapters, it doesn't matter. You are ready and go and write it. Remind yourself, even if you prepare double that time, you would still feel underprepared. Everybody, everybody feels underprepared. It's a normal thing. So this is one thing that you have to remind yourself. Second thing is, when you see other people, you might feel like, okay, I'm not prepared, but that guy, all, all these people, they are so well prepared. In fact, I want to share an anecdote here, real, real experience. When I was uh, writing the IITJ exam, which was, was a long time back, um, while I was, I was, it was very hard. The paper, question paper was really tough and I was, I was struggling, literally sweating. It was in summer and, uh, while I was just maybe on the on the third page of the booklet that I was writing, there was one guy uh, just like one or two rows away from me. He raised his hand and he uh, hand and he asked for extra paper, and then one more paper. And I was wondering, my booklet is like barely going to get filled, and this guy has taken already like two or three extra papers. And then after all the four exams, all the four uh, papers were over. I asked him, "How was the question paper?" He said, "Yeah, it was pretty easy," and I was. I was shocked, like I found it, I found the paper really hard. And then I thought, okay, this guy will make it to maybe like top 100 rank. This was my belief. And when the results came from that center, I was the only candidate who made it, which means he did not make it. Now, look at the fallacy here. I thought that this guy is the best prepared guy, but it was just an illusion. We often, we don't know what anybody else is, what their preparation is, it doesn't matter. But Sometimes we just get too caught up in it. So whenever that happens, remember this. Maybe the story can help you. Let go. Focus on your thing. You are ready. Go and give it your best shot and you will do well. All right. So these are four ideas which are all actionable. And I hope that whatever exam you take, whatever the context is, you'll make use of it and do really well. So thank you for watching. And I hope to see you soon in the next video. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.